So as part of this celebration in which we are celebrating the hundred years of Guruji <coughs> B.K. Sainga, this tree which we all together planted was planted in his sacred memory. And what better it is to plant a sacred tree in the sacred memory of a sacred person. <laughs> the whole path of yoga is in fact the path of planting a seed, planting a tree. That's what the teacher does. He has to find some fertile soil, ground, he has to identify it, and then he has to sow a seed there. And then, first of all, it is for a while, it is a teacher's duty to nourish it, to water it from both sides. Also, the student has to work, and also the teacher has to work. Till then, also some protection is required. That is why we have these traditions which limit but also protect but also limit after some growth takes place then these limitations of traditions are no more required <coughs> this specific rudraksha tree is one of the two trees which are related to lord shiva what does lord shiva symbolize Lord Shiva symbolizes supreme wisdom, supreme yogic wisdom. And this tree, and then there is another tree, Bilva tree, known as the Bale, Bale tree, which each leaf consists of three seemingly separate leaves, but connected to one stem. And this is again a deeply symbolical meaning in the philosophy of yoga. 
So these two trees, the Rudraksha tree, I think as far as the Rudraksha bead is concerned, the most common one has five mukha. You know these lines? So you have one, two, three, four, and five. Though one can find uh, from one to 14 facets in it, but uh, the five faced one is the most common one. And uh, I'm not a scholar of uh, Shaivism. That's why I cannot speak uh, authoritatively on that. But for meditative purposes in the Shaiva traditions, Lord Shiva is often meditated upon as having five faces. And here there is a seed which has five faces. And that's most likely where the connection started. And uh, then, of course, the most practical purpose of this seed is to use it as a rosary to count the 108 mantras. So when a person practices mantra yoga, repetition of a mantra, Patanjali speaks of it in the first chapter as japa. There are various ways of counting 108, that specific number. And this is one of the best known ways to count the mantras. And for this reason, this uh, is considered, this tree is considered a very sacred tree. So we have planted it in the memory of Guruji on, in the year where 100 years have passed. So we hope that with that tree, this center and everyone connected to this center, the students and the teachers as well, will experience gradual growth in the same way like this tree. Very natural, very gradual. That's how real growth takes place. And it is this type of growth through yoga that I'm planning to speak about in the next one hour. <clears throat> Rishikesh is not only the capital of yoga. Rishikesh, that's something that it's, you know, it's just used to, prom it's used to promote the place by the tourism department. <laughs> uh, sorry? Ad Adventure City, yes. <laughs> but yesterday, uh, the, 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 the governor, he referred to it as the capital of yoga. And very often it is referred to as the capital of yoga. That's a new designation within the last 10 years or so. But this place was certainly the place where people came to do sadhana, yoga sadhana, where people came to practice yoga. But practice, not only a momentary practice, not a practice that lasts on the mat, but a practice that is gradually incorporated into one's life and thus influences every aspect of our life. That, that kind of practice in Sanskrit will be called sadhana which then influences every aspect of our life. And someone who practices yoga in such a way, in Sanskrit he will be called yoga sadhaka. And that's this word we often come across here whenever we speak to the wise masters. We come across these words sadhaka and sadhana, an ardent devotional dedicated in the sense, dedicated practice of anything. And the word sadhana in India is, all, is used in all different contexts, not only yoga sadhana, but also, for example, classical dancers, when the way they practice 
their dance to go into deep into the depth of it what they see as nritta yoga the yoga of dance they they also approach it with a sense of sadhana similarly whether it is a sculptor whether it is a painter any field of art any because art ultimately is a meditative expression and so the dedicated approach to perfect oneself to become a siddha an accomplished one a perfect one a person first has to become a sadhaka only a sadhaka can become a siddha siddha which means an accomplished one so this is the land of the sadhakas sadhakas when someone wanted to be a sadhaka in any part of the country then they used to come to these himalayan areas to places like rishikesh to do their sadhana to become a sadhaka so in the next one hour i want to speak a little bit about what it means to be a sadhaka just a few things first of all to define it in the context of yoga a sadhaka is someone that uses the practice of yoga to achieve something greater in his life in his or her life and what is that greater to use it as a means to transcend suffering physical as well as mental through what through eliminating the darkness of ignorance and its concomitants which is ego attachment hatred and fear and how does a person achieve that through searching for the light of wisdom within one self that is in short really in short so three things transcendence from suffering by identifying their cause which is ignorance ego attachment hatred and fear so then the effort is directed towards transcending these five fundamental causes of suffering that patanjali speaks about in the yoga sutras and how does someone transcend these five fundamental causes of suffering by searching for wisdom and not knowledge but wisdom because the words that patanjali uses are clearly defined as not something that we learn from someone not something that we learn from a teacher not something that we learn by reading a book but something that we discover within ourselves through the practice of yoga so the texts the teachings of the masters are a, are an instrument they are not the goal the moments that we spend with our teachers they are simply an instrument knowledge itself that we acquire through these means by which now i mean second hand knowledge is only a means an instrument ultimately to find it within oneself so someone who has this higher purpose such a person is called sadhaka and for this what does what he has to do he has to do what is he has to pursue what is hita hita which means beneficial beneficial in our personal life something that benefits us ourselves and facilitates this journey of yoga that i in in a few words tried to delineate three steps elimination of suffering elimination of ignorance and acquiring of wisdom the light of wisdom <clears throat> and for this i think again 
the very, if we come back to the very foundations, where, how does the journey unfold? By doing good, by doing what is beneficial, by doing good. And someone who does what is beneficial, someone who does what is good, he is, such a person is called sadhu. Today, unfortunately, you know, when we speak of all these sadhus, the moment we hear the word sadhu, someone wearing red robes comes into our mind, or, you know, just these kinds of robes. Such a person comes into our mind, and mostly now because, sadly, most of the sadhus which we refer to here in Rishigesha begging money on the streets. So when we hear this word, most likely now, to the, to the visitors of this time, these people will come into the mind. But it was originally a very beautiful concept. Sadhu simply means good, nice, a good person. That's all what the word sadhu means. For example, in, 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 Hin, in Sanskrit language, when somebody says, good, 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 very good, very good, then he will say in, in Sanskrit, sadhu, sadhu. Good, good, very good. Sadhu, sadhu. That is what they will say. So sadhu simply means good. And the very simple aphorism that we find in the Upanishads, sadhu kari, sadhur bhavati. How does a person become good? Because the goal of, the, of yoga is to become good. How does a person become good? By doing good. And that's why one of the simplest sutras, one of the simplest aphorisms that Swami Shivananda, one of the greatest yoga masters from Rishikesh gave to the whole world was very simple. Do, be good, do good. That's all. And it is from this Rigveda, from this mantra of the Vrhadaranyaka Upanishad. Sadhukari, sadhur bhavati. Do good, become good. So, Sadhaka then starts his journey by being good, by becoming good. <clears throat> That's what it means. And how does a person becomes how does a person become good? Again, let us go back to the Upanishadic masters and ask them what they say. And I talked about this also a little bit in the yoga festival, I will not repeat too much of what I spoke there, but nonetheless, because it is related to this, it has to be mentioned that how does a person become good? By doing good. But how does a person do good? By becoming equal. And that's why one of the, one of the teachings that uh, there uh, in the Upanishads is that Whatever is equal, that is good. And what is not equal, summer means equal, balanced, that is good. And whatever is not equal, what is vishama, what is not equal, what is not balanced, that is not good. Now, but again, the English word equal is a mere translation of the Sanskrit word sama, which is so similar, in fact, to the closer word in English would be same, to be the same, sama and same. So what does this equality that we are speaking about mean? Again, the masters say that learn it by looking at the sun. Look at the sun, one of the greatest masters who wakes up all all of us. And it is the very source of life on this planet. It is the very source of life for all of us. Let that be our teacher and see how the sun is the same. In three ways, they identified that there are three types of samenesses in the sun. The first type is that the sun does not favor anybody over anyone else. If somebody wishes to be in shade, it is their own issue. But the sun bestows its light 
on, a, on every living being equally. I remember when I used to sit along the Ganga, I don't know now because of so many tourists, uh, earlier there used to be these uh, black lizards, iguanas or I don't know how you call them, you know, big, uh, black. They, they used to be so big and uh, because they are cold-blooded creatures, so whenever the sun used to come out, they used to come on these huge rocks and sit on top of them just to imbibe the sun. So on one side, you could see the, the meditating swamis from Shivananda Ashram and the ashram also basking in the sun, you know, in meditation completely, peacefully, before all this rafting started. I'm talking a little bit about further up when on all those peaceful beaches. And uh, on one side, you could see these, uh, uh, these big lizards basking in the sun completely in rest. You know, there was no movement on both sides. So the sun was equal for both. Also for this, way, for this meditating yogi and also to this lizard. To everyone, the sun bestows its light equally. So whatever we have to offer, there should be no consideration of whether the person belongs to our group or not, or they belong to. If we are offering to, the, to, to humanity and ultimately to all beings, then let anybody who wishes to have it, let everybody take it. There should be no, not someone more favorite and someone less. So that is the sec first type of equality. And the second type of equality is, which comes through the practice of yoga, by developing endurance and inner strength so that siddhya siddhyo failure and victory one can remain equal whether one fails in one's pursuits it becomes a cause of depression we feel sad that we have failed good for a while because it as long as it inspires to do better but not that it leads us to our annihilation and complete downfall and giving up the journey. No, just as a source of inspiration. And for that, immense strength is required. The spirit of that child to stand up again and again is required. That is the spirit that a yogin requires. So to be able to remain balanced in painful as well as pleasurable moments. And that is also, we can learn it from the sun. The sun always remains the same every day, unlike the moon. The moon changes, but the sun doesn't. Every day, the sun remains the same, whether it is sunny, whether it is thundering, whether it is a clear day, the sun is always the same. Whatever happens down here on this earthly level, you will laugh when I'm saying this. That is how the yogis used to laugh when somebody said that I am sad, I'm unhappy. Because they used to say that if it's thundering down here, then how does it affect the sunshine? The sun is shining always. It doesn't matter whether it is thundering, whether it is clouded. The sun is unaffected because it is high above whatever is happening. And someone like a yogi who has become a witness to what, is, what happens on the level of the mind, for them they laugh in the same way. They say what happens on the level of the mind doesn't affect me. I'm just a witness to it. I'm the sun. And with that awareness and the inner strength of endurance which a person then develops, that's the practical aspect. A person can retain a peaceful state of mind even when in the painful moments as well as moments of extreme joy. Still, he can retain his inner composure, inner clarity, inner peace. That is the second kind of sameness. And the third one, is, it's a play of words that the 
Vedic Sanskrit masters played around the word sama, which means same. What they say, sa means he and mam to me. So what, 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 what by this they, they, tr they are trying to say is that the sun has this, even though it is equal towards all, mm -hmm. it has this personal relationship with everyone that everyone feels that the sun is enlightening the world for me. And I think what I'm trying to convey is most beautifully explained by this example that uh, uh, see two people traveling in, on, in opposite directions, one from east to west and from, one from west to east on a train, both of them will feel that the sun is accompanying me. <laughs> from east to west, also he will also feel that the sun is accompanying me, and somebody traveling from west to east will also feel that he is accompanying. The sun is accompanying me. So in this way, even though the sun is equal, everyone feels this inner deep connection, individual, very deeply personal connection with with the sun. And the same thing, for example, if you look at uh, when, when the sun re gets reflected in a small little mirror, the whole sun gets reflected. Isn't it? The whole sun gets reflected in a mirror, even in a drop of water. Just take it from the Ganga and throw it up. The whole sun gets reflected into it, in that tiny little water. That is the capacity that the sun has. So in this way, also the capacity to address personally also. That is what the word summer, you know, not only, you know, sometimes people just speak over everybody, you know, but to have, to be able to address personal issues, I think when we come in contact with the masters, the way they are mindful of Everyone in the class addressing every person's needs, individual needs as well, through their classes to incorporate all of that. That is a challenge, but it is a challenge must, worth mastering. So when the, when the idea of sadhu, goodness, which is based on being the same, then we have to keep these three things in our mind. So this is a little bit the philosophical aspect behind becoming a sadhaka. Let us talk a little bit also about the practical means, because how to, how to lead a life, what does it, the life of a sadhaka look like, the ideal life, how close we can get to it, that depends on our strength, on our determination, on our dedication. I think, uh, if I'm not wrong, then mathematicians would agree that there is no perfect circle. Every good circle is just very close to that perfectly round circle. But we cannot have a hundred percent perfectly round circle. The same thing is true about the asana. One can never, I don't know what a perfect asana looks like, one can really just get closer and closer. Every step that we take is just a step closer to that perfect asana. We can just get closer. Every step, every effort that we make is to get closer. So the same spirit we have to have also in this context of ideal sadhana. Not much time is left, but one most practical, the most practical means that one can have to, to explore how to become a sadhaka is what Patanjali has also mentioned in the context of inner purification in the first chapter, he says that if you want to purify your mind content, meditate and contemplate on those who have already purified it. 
means just choose an idol, ideal and try to live the life in the image of that person. The choice can be, he, he just says, Vita Raga, somebody who has transcended attachment, hatred, and anger. That's all what he says. This is, this is all that he, that he wants to find in that person. That's all, nothing more. The rest is our choice. And that's why I think one of the easiest means to become a sadhaka is to look at the lives biographies of the great masters, the great human beings, whatever we want to define them from our own culture, from our own tradition, from our own faith, from our own part of the world. Every part of this world has created great thinkers, great masters, great devotees, great men who have helped in their own humble way to make this world a more beautiful place. So to read, and let me again point out, no one is perfect. I have read not many biographies, but many, some biographies I have read, even my ideal, for example, is Mahatma Gandhi. One of the ideals is Mahatma Gandhi. His life was far, more, far than perfect. He made many mistakes, but that's the beauty of it. It gives us courage. It gives us inspiration that if such a person who made these mistakes could reach there, then we can also reach. So no one's life is perfect, but it inspires us. And that's why I think also the Upanishadic masters, when they say that if you have any doubt regarding any deed, any conduct, look for someone and then they define what kind of person. They, 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 give, they don't give names that look at this and this person's life. They, give, they try to explain what kind of person it should be. First of all, it should be someone who is competent enough and has the intention to understand the correct message behind the yogic teachings. That is the first thing. Then he should be himself devoted in good deeds, engaged in good deeds. So that is the second thing. Is, is our ideal himself or herself engaged in good deeds? And yes, the third thing that the masters say, is he engaged because somebody else is telling him to be engaged in good deeds? Or is he engaged because the inspiration comes from within. That is the third thing. The inspiration should come from within. Not because religion says or because somebody says that you should do good. But the call should be from within to do good. So look for someone who has that inner call to be good and is free from roughness in his life is soft. Soft and free from prejudices against the Sanskrit word is explained both free from rough, which means very soft, and it also means free from prejudice against someone. If we find prejudice in their teaching, then we should be careful. If we like other things, let us follow that, but let us not follow the prejudice aspect. Yes. That should always be avoided at all costs. And one should only, someone who is only engaged in good deeds, not for name or fame, but simply to become good and to help everybody else to be good. If we can identify such individuals in our life, then let us read their biographies, let us read about the difficulties that they had in their lives, let us read the mistakes that they made and then how they overcome. And I think that is one of the reasons, uh, for example, if you look at the lives of the Vedic rishis, 
you know, then you will see all the mistakes <laughs> that they have committed. More mistakes than actually perfection, you know. And that's why sometimes people in, in the Indian context avoid speaking about them because they have made so many mistakes. And culturally, some people feel ashamed even to speak about them. But that is, the sad, that is the sad thing because that's ultimately what inspires us. That you see someone like Vishwamitra who became the friend of the whole world. But he also, he also became angry at some point. He, was, he flared up in extreme anger. And as a king, due to his anger, he killed. He made many mistakes. One after the other, he made many mistakes. But then, by walking on the path of yoga, one day he became, he, he became what his parents intended him to be, the friend of the world. And then he becomes a great rishi and becomes the seer to whom this famous Gayatri Mantra, Om Bhur Bhuvaswaha Tatsavitur Varenyam, to whom this mantra, was revealed, the seer of this mantra. But his life was made of many mistakes. It was filled with mistakes. And like this, we have so many Vaidic great masters who started from, for example, Maharshi Valmiki, who started as a robber, killed people to get their money and wealth. And then yet, a radical transformation took place. So that is what yoga is about and that is what sadhana is about for this reading the lives of any great human beings of our choice whoever we are we feel respected it and then trying to imitate them is one of the easiest and one of the best options a sadhaka Because he is patient and persevering, he does little, but does it regularly. That's again a very important aspect. One can say that he's not, he's more like a turtle, a tortoise, than a rabbit. You know that story of, the famous story of, of the, the, uh, uh, what, what is that, running? Yeah, but the running. Race, race yes. The race of, uh, uh, of the turtle and the rabbit. <laughs> the famous story. So he is, he does little. He starts by doing little. Not, you know, when people come to Rishikesh, ah, we have come to the sacred city. We have to do this also. We have to do this also. And then at some point it becomes like you have had too many sweets, you know, and then for the next one year, you don't even want to look at it. <laughs> Not like that. And I, I see that. I've seen that with so many people, you know. They come to Rishikesh, they completely dedicate themselves. We have to acquire self-enlightenment now when we have reached here. Deepest states of meditation, you know. 24 hours yoga, not sleeping, no balance, and you know, this type of approach. They come with this. And then, after a while, slowly and slowly, it's downhill, downhill. And then a moment comes when ah, all this is useless. It doesn't help in any way. And then everything is forgotten. So, not that. What that's why Patanjali says, Dirghakala, for a long period, three things he says. Dirghakala, perfection in yoga is acquired when a person practices for a long period. There are no two-minute solutions in yoga. That's very clear. There are no, it's, that's why look at the tree. You cannot just transform a seed into a seed. That doesn't happen in moments. You know those people who come to Rishikesh to become teachers in one month, they are trying to transform a seed into a seed in one month. Is that even possible? 
how long it takes you have to sow the seed and don't be like the monkey, you know. Again, there is this story of a monkey who sows a seed and then after 10 minutes removes the, removes the soil to see whether it has germinated and, uh, or not. You know, then again after, after 10 minutes has a plant come out of it or not. Not like that. Dirghagala. Long period, for a long period, for an extended period, and regularly. What is most important is regularity. Once I just heard somebody saying this, that once Guruji was asked that, do you practice regularly? He said, yes, I practice regularly, but sir, you, are, you lead such a busy life. And how can I mean one hours, two hours, how, how many hours do you practice regularly? He said, even if I can't practice many hours, I practice at least three asanas. His list of the three asanas was Adhomukhashwanasana, Sarvangasana, and Shirshasana. But again, these are very advanced asanas, and one can practice hundreds of asanas within Shirshasana itself, for someone like Guruji, for someone like me, for someone like us, we can choose our own asanas. But at least let us stick to them every day, regularly. Whatever practice we have decided to undertake, whatever we have learned, just so that we don't give up. At least three asanas, if not more. If 30, fine. If there is more time, if there is more freedom, fine. But just, just, even Adho Mukha Shwanasana is such a wonderful asana. Every dog does it in the morning after waking up. Why cannot a human being do it <laughs> every morning? <laughs> so even just that much. And it's an amazing, I mean, from my personal experience, it has cured so many of my uh, back-related, computer-related, laptop-related issues. You know, so it's a wonderful asana that I just do every day, even if I can't do other asanas. That is one asana that I stick to, whatever the cost might be. And there is no cost because it just take, takes one or two minutes. And if you do it straight away after waking up, the body is so stiff. So the feeling, the resultant feeling, the resultant soothing feeling is really amazing. At least, that's how I feel. So, Dirghakala, long period, Nairantarya, continuity. Not that some, some, how many years have you been practicing yoga? 20 years. No, but for the past four or five years, I have not been practicing. <laughs> not that kind of practice. That we are practicing yoga for 20 years. Like this, I've also been practicing yoga for now uh, 30 years. <laughs> Because as a child I started, my parents started teaching me yoga, but then as I grew up for years together, I stopped till I came back again. So, Nairantarya, continuity, is what is important. And the third thing that he says which is important is Satkara. Generally it is translated as dedication. But what it simply means, just sometimes, you know, that's why I feel that uh, the English translations of the Yoga Sutra are sometimes so misleading. Nobody has translated this simple word. Th the simple translation is presence of mind. Sat means presence. And satkara, to be present. That's all. People translate it as devotion. People translate it as dedication. It's just presence of mind. Whatever we practice, let us practice it with complete presence of mind. Even if it is one Adhomukha Shwanasana. Let us be with ourselves for that one or two minutes. That's not too much to ask for. Just, just be, just feel how it feels in the body. Not thinking now I have to take bath, now I have to paste, paste my, uh, I, have to, I have to brush my teeth. Not what I will do for the rest of the day, what I will have in my breakfast. Not that. Just enjoy the asana and its feeling in the body. Total presence there. When these three things come, then our practice of yoga becomes deeply 
rooted. That is, see the word that Patanjali uses is again the same word. Now you see this tree which we have so which we have planted there, it has to find its roots. It has to become deeply rooted. Till then we have to nourish it. And after a while when it is deeply rooted, then it becomes completely self-sustaining. Then it doesn't require protection, then it doesn't require anything. Anything, it will become completely self-sustaining. And that is the word that Patanjali uses, dridhabhumi. Dridhabhumi means deeply rooted in the ground. That is when, and then can someone uproot these trees? How difficult it would be. You know, you would have to get big machines. That is what would be required for someone to take us away from our yoga practice. Because then we cannot be uprooted from it. The more deeply we become rooted in it, the more difficult it becomes to uproot ourselves. There is no circumstance in our life. And that's why when I, when I hear Mataji you know, saying that, uh, that Guruji, in the last moment also he was doing his asana practice. You know, uh, uh, props were being taken to the hospital in the last moment, all those stories. I always tell myself that he, he could not do otherwise. He could not have given up his practice because his practice was so deeply rooted that he, Guruji would not have been able to do otherwise. It was so much part of his nature, so much part of his being. That is what Dridhabhumi means. And someone who is desirous of being deeply rooted in such a way, I think such a person should be understood as sadhaka. Then a sadhaka grows on the path of yoga like a tree, blossoms like a flower, and transforms into what we can say from a, kit, from a caterpillar into a butterfly. The transformation that we, that we speak about that takes place. But this transformation is very gradual. Try to hurry up things. Try to hurry up the growth of a tree. Try to hurry up the blossoming of a bud. Try to hurry up the transformation of a caterpillar into a butterfly. You destroy it. One has to have patience and perseverance. That is the point that I was... Don't think yoga is something artificial. Like this body, it takes months to, to be ready to come out of the womb of the mother, to be born. And then it takes years to grow into a human being that we are. In the same way, growth on the path of yoga, which is from being human to superhuman, that growth also requires time. But what is required is patience and perseverance. So that is one thing. And the last thing that I wish to mention is because people speak of the yamas and niyamas, let us identify the most important ones because there are ten. And sometimes because there are ten, people speak about them, but the question is how much do we incorporate them into our practice so that our asana practice can become a means of something greater. Not only just physical health and physical fitness, but also pranic health, pranic fitness. Also psychological health and psychological fitness. But how to do that? For that, I think we have to identify the most important ones and see, because I'm speaking about really about the very fundamental steps that can transform our practice from just abhyasa, mere practice, repetition, you know. Abhyasa means, one of the meanings of the word abhyasa is to repeat things 
again and again. Then it becomes mechanical. You know? But so that we can take it deeper, so that it becomes a sadhana. Sadhana, by the, by the way, the word sadhana is feminine, but if you use it in a, in a neutral word, it is also the Sanskrit word for an instrument. Sadhana also means an instrument. So this is the instrument to achieve something. So for this, four things, four of the yamas and, niy yamas and niyamas, I would identify which have been given tremendous importance by the masters. The first, the first one is the first one of the ten, which is ahimsa, non-violence. How, how can we lead mindfully our life in such a way so that we minimize inflicting suffering on others? If we want freedom from suffering, then we have to lead a life in such a mindful way so that we mindfully reduce the suffering that we inflict on other living beings. And that is what is encapsulated in the word ahimsa, nonviolence. So that one and uh, the yogic masters such as Vyasa in his commentary on the Yoga Sutras, repeatedly the yogic masters point out that the rest of the yamas and niyamas are just required to acquire perfection in this one, to deepen it, to embellish this one, to make this one more shining. So this one is really the central part because to lead such a life is not easy. A person has to, has to, has to have immense inner strength. But the other yamas and niyamas, the other yogic practices, asana, pranayama, give a person that strength. Then our asana practice, if we fail, fine, like a child, we fall down. We fail, but we repeatedly try becoming better. At least that goal should be there, to become better in our practice of nonviolence and use asana as a means to derive that strength to become increasingly nonviolent in our deeds, in our words, and even in our thoughts. So that is uh, the first one amongst the yamas. And then the other three are the last of the ten, tapas, austerity in which we take upon ourselves some hardship. Just uh, moments ago when I was walking down, I had a call from a very dear friend and he, uh, he's getting retired. And he gave me a call and he said that in May I'm getting retired. I want to spend some time in solitude after my retirement for three, four months. Can you help me? Uh, organize a place and it should not be a too luxurious place. It should be a place where I can experience some hardship, where not everything will be easy, you know. So somewhere, somewhere, that is the spirit of tapas. And asana is a form of tapas. Pranayama is a form of tapas. So when we practice asana with that spirit, not with the spirit of making every asana comfortable. <laughs> because that is a sthira sukham asana people, you know, misunderstand. Most likely I'm planning because uh, things got a little bit uh, uh, confused here after I spoke. Uh, suddenly I was not scheduled to speak at the yoga festival, but then uh, Mataji said, speak on the meanings of yoga. Then today, that's why I'm not speaking on the meanings of yoga, because I've already spoken about it. So I'm speaking about what I was intending to speak on the second talk. This is what I'm speaking today. And uh, then maybe in the second talk, we will speak about uh, the, the sutras in which Patanjali speaks on asana. So then we will discuss that. But before that, the readiness to endure some discomfort 
in our life, in our asana practice, in anything. You know, this complete falling into luxury that everything, and that's why, uh, you know, there are these smart mets. I've heard about them which can tell you whether the pressure on both sides is equal or not. What's going on in the name of yoga? This is something that your consciousness, then with all the smartphones, foolish people arise. <laughs> with all these smartphones, for smart mets, we will end up becoming foolish yogis. <laughs> Full yogis, because the mets will be smart, our props will be smart, and we will, we will not derive any smartness. The idea is to train our power of observation and to be able to see the balance, not depending on the met each time for telling us whether we are pressurizing on boats. As a tool for a while, it is fine, like every prop. Also that, if we can have it, fine. If such a prop actually exists, people, I've not seen it, I've just heard it. And I always, what I hear, I take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> but uh, that tapas, that readiness to endure some suffering, some discomfort. Oh, no, no, this is uncomfortable for me. Endure it. Take it as a sadhana. Tapas, that aspect. And then also... Swadhyaya. Swadhyaya. The, the, after tapas comes swadhyaya. Swadhyaya which means self-study. Studying in its first step it is studying the yogic teachings which tell us about our deeper layer so that, to, so that our practice does not remain only on the physical level but by an understanding of the deeper layers to our being, we can then also take our practice to those deeper layers. But for that, first of all, if we just, because all we see with our senses and in what, what we experience basically is this physical body. And that's why all that we are concerned with is then always the look of this body. And that's all. But what about the breath? What about the mind? What about all our thoughts? What about the information that we accumulate? There are so many. What about all the memories? What about this sense of I, which defines who we are and how we understand ourselves, how we believe what we believe ourselves to be? Because that is what defines our reaction to others, all our tags that we have accumulated. There are all these because I think this human body is very much like an onion. You know, all the different layers peel it away. So all these layers have to be addressed. We just see the external layer and if we just try to benefit from our asana practice on the external layer, then we are just painting the outermost layer of the onion, without reaching the deeper layers, the depth. So for that, Swadhyaya is also very important. And the last one is Ishwara Pranidhana. Ishwara Pranidhana means to surrender oneself to the consciousness within, which is within oneself and which is within every living being, to surrender oneself to that consciousness. Now again, this is a very deep idea. Let us come back to this in our next class. Today you had already a very busy morning. Things started late, so I will not take this idea any further. But in simple terms, it simply means to share, to give, to bring happiness in the lives of others as well. To be dedicated to that. Because Ishwara, what is Ishwara? Where does Ishwara exist? Again, the yogic masters say, Ishwara Sarvabhutanam Hriddeshir Junatishthati. In the hearts of all 
beings. That is where Ishwara exists in the hearts of all beings. So it is dedicating oneself to that essence, to that omnipresent essence, which is present at the heart of all beings. So if we can lead our life in such a way, by constantly being mindful of these principles and allow them to direct our yoga practice by taking our yoga practice as an instrument to achieve these in our daily dealings, then our yoga practice becomes a form of sadhana. And then we become a sadhaka. Any questions that uh, remain? Then we can conclude. <coughs> oh. oh. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramayaha, sarve bhadrani pasyantu, maakash chiddukha bhag bhavet, om shantihi, shantihi, shantihi.